Hey, what's going on, everybody? Day 1,972,000 of quarantine. Although some people are allowed out, we are still not unless we are going to work. So as usual, we're going to bring you another video today. Uh, took a lot of people's advice, went out and got a mic so that my volume won't be terrible and chattery and the way it was the first, you know, 12 videos we did where I got a lot of feedback like, bruh, you really need a mic. It sounds terrible. So here we are. Look, got a mic. <laughs> so and shout out to my boy, uh, Chris Martin, who actually friggin' is the one that, you know, turned me on to and was like, hey, check out this one. And, you know, it, it's the best kind of stuff to use. So took his advice, got it. So hopefully the volume is not an issue now when we're, when you guys are watching these videos. But, uh, Today, we are actually going to do probably a relatively short one, one of our shorter videos. And we always say that, but this actually will be a little shorter. <laughs> um, we're actually going to talk about the Dallas Cowboys picking up Andy Dalton and what it means to Dak Prescott and the Cowboys organization as a whole. Um, and it, it really was, you know, an interesting pickup because obviously the Cowboys go out and they they pick up another player that, you know, they got to pay. And while Dak is in these contract negotiations, because ultimately he wants to be the highest paid player in NFL history, you know, the guy wants what's looking like 40 mil a year. And, you know, he doesn't want his contract backloaded or anything. You know, he wants 40 mil a year on a shorter year deal as well. And, you know, the Cowboys seem to be going out and picking up and paying all these other players and not giving him the contract they wanted, which is, uh, to me, it's actually really smart because I've said it, you know, I, I don't feel that Dak is an elite quarterback. He's a good quarterback, but he's not in that elite category where he should be getting elite money. I always said uh, the best way for me, like what money he should be making is more of like the uh, Deshaun Watson kind of pay you know, right, right on that kind of scale where he's making good money, but he's not making 40 mil a year. And, uh, you know, he complained about getting franchise tagged because, you know, we, we chose to tag him, which ultimately means, you know, he's going to play under a one year deal. But when you get franchise tag, you, you do get top dollar for whatever your position may be. There's like a, a, a set income that they look at and are like, okay, if you're a quarterback and you get franchise tagged, they do some type of equation, but you get top money. So he's still going to be making $30 million this year or close to, which is a gargantuan leap considering he was on a rookie deal where he was barely making a million dollars a year. So, you know, this is still a gargantuan jump for him. And, you know, there was talk of him possibly sitting out because he didn't want to play under the franchise tag. But that's just nuts to me. I don't see Dak, you know, not reporting to camp or, or sitting out because he still is getting paid just as much as the Drew Breeses and uh, the top quarterbacks. But, um, you know, it does say something about the Cowboys not wanting to give him that big contract right now. And don't get me wrong, they've offered him contracts already that he's turned down, but they were closer to the range of the early, you know, the, the lower $30 million area a year. And uh, they just, they couldn't come to an agreement on, you know, the years or the actual dollar amount and they're close, but ultimately is, you know, by giving him the franchise tag, what they're telling him is they, they want to see one more year out of him because you can talk about everything you want with Dak Prescott as far as stats go, because last year, statistically, he was statistically the best all around quarterback in the league you know, almost through for 5,000 yards and blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, the only statistic that matters is wins and losses. And he went eight and eight. So, you know, you don't want to pay a guy that kind of money when you haven't really gotten a, a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of wins out of him yet. And he's actually dropped, you know, his first year, rookie of the year, he has, you know, an amazing year. And they win, you know, like 11 games. And it is next year, they win nine games. And then last year, they win eight games. So he's actually regressing at his wins. But he wants more money because statistically, he's been getting better and better and better. But like I said, the only stat that matters to me is 
wins and losses, and he's been eight and eight. So they go out and as an insurance policy, they sign Andy Dalton, who was just recently released by the Bengals. And um, first and foremost, we, we got to let you know that this, is, this was not, he was not brought in to challenge Dak for the starting job. That's not why they signed him. He is strictly an insurance policy, and he is going to be the backup. That's what they signed him for, and they got him very cheap, too. You know, a $7 million deal, which ultimately is only worth $3 million unless he starts five or more games, and then he'll have to get paid out. So $3 million a year for a veteran quarterback you know, is, is not bad on a one-year deal. You know, it's, it's got way more upside than it does downside. And we didn't have a, you know, an actual legit backup in Cooper Rush. Cooper Rush has never actually, um, you know, gotten any playing time as a starter other than, you know, preseason games and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it, it is going to bring uh, an, an added dimension to the Dallas Cowboys by bringing in a veteran quarterback like that. So yeah. yeah, but I'm thinking more along the line like it's this sounds to me I think it sounds more like a, a McCarthy plan though. Because it's it, it's an intriguing insurance policy, especially when you talk about when you bring up the last um he gets basically he starts five games, gets an additional four million dollars. To me it sounds like this is a prep thing because I mean amongst the whole corona thing and we're not even sure if the NFL season was gonna season is going to take off or kick off. So I bring that up because you probably don't, you, that's the reason why we're not hearing a whole lot of sitting out. You heard it in the beginning, but it's not continual that like, yeah, he's planning to sit out. He's planning to hold out. He's not going to OTA. He's not going to volunteer workouts, none of that stuff, because we don't know the season going on, but picking up Andy Dalton does take the leverage away from a relief because again, this is a QB that's had success in the regular season, that is a decent quarterback. This is not some random Joe Blow that, you know, never had any success, is just looking for a new change of scenery, and hopefully he can jumpstart his career. Like, Andy Dalton was successful. So I think he was more brought into play as in if Dak decides to sit the season out. And if Dak decides he doesn't, you know, he ain't going to sign a long-term contract. Yeah. Which to me, in a way, it bodes well for him. It's smart. You got you got a a, a quarterback that's one is on a team that doesn't didn't have well is on a team with a whole lot more weapons than he used to have. You know he's not going to a team that has just Omar Cooper and that's it. You know and, and a really good tight end. Like no, this dude's got a legit receiving core. He's got a legit offensive line that can protect him. He's got a legit running back. Absolutely. You know, playing with a very successful head coach. Mm -hmm. you know, that's been able to do things uh, on, on offense and with the defense. Um, actually, even that, he's he's playing on a team with a defense that's vastly improved, specifically in the front seven. Maybe not so much in the secondary, but, I mean, it's still – he's he's in a better situation in Dallas than he was in Cincinnati. So – and the fact that he's a Texas guy. You know, he's a Texas kid. So yeah. he's got support, family, and all that stuff. Like, it may reinvigorate him. So mm – -hmm. Me looking at uh, Andy Dalton pickup, like, yeah, it's it's a hell of a pickup. It's a great pickup because, yeah, you get a, a quality veteran court uh, backup and someone you brought up before is like Nick Foles. You know, you saw – everyone saw what Nick Foles was able to do. Nick Foles was a starter in the league. He had his shot. They decided, okay, they couldn't go nowhere with him. They brought in Carson Wentz. But when Carson Wentz went down, because of all that experience he got, had being a starter and playing in the league, like – he was able to win him a Super Bowl. Like, I see the same similar situation being, you know, in Dallas. Even if Dak says, okay, I'm going to play out, you know, my $30 million deal, my franchise tender, if he gets hurt, you don't lose anything. Andy Dalton comes in. In fact, you might be able to elevate what you're able to do with Andy Dalton mm -hmm. than with Dak. And, I mean, I, I have said it before that, um, you know, you've had quarterbacks in the past that, you know, they start on one team in one certain system and they don't have a lot of success. And then they go to another team in a completely different system and it seems to fit them. And we've seen it in history with guys like uh, Kurt Warner, you know, where, where he started off and he had kind of bounced around, you know, from place to place before he really, really found his niche. 
where he was sitting behind Trent Green with the Rams. And then Trent Green goes down and, you know, he steps in with Dick Vermeil as the coach and the system fits him beautifully. And the same thing, like you talked about with Nick Foles, you know, Nick Foles was on the Eagles once before and it was with a different coach and, you know, things didn't go the way they wanted it to. So they trade him away and he goes to another team and he, you know, he, he doesn't get a whole lot of opportunities and he's still just like this average guy. And they bring him back to Philly with Doug Peterson and in that offense and that type of scheme, all of a sudden fit him. You know, you could tell he was very, very comfortable in it. And, you know, it's, I don't care what anybody says. He ran that team way better than Carson Wentz did. And the guys seemed to rally around him as well. When he was on the field, they had like that extra hitch in their giddy up. You know, everybody seemed to believe in him and, and whatever the case may have been, but you know, it came together and he was very, very good. And I mean, you saw the final outcome, you know, he, he winds up being a backup that winds up taking him to the Super Bowl and winning it and being an MVP. Now, I mean, mm-hmm. do I see that happening with Andy Dalton? I mean, I have no frigging clue. You know, you have no idea where it's going to lead to, but it definitely has that capability to, because like you said, he's not some average Joe guy. You know, this guy has played in the league for almost a decade now, and he's been successful. You know, you look at times where um, since he had some, some real talent on the team, and, you know, they were good. They did make the playoffs numerous years. Now, yeah, the biggest knock on Andy Dalton was, you know, he couldn't win a playoff game because since he hasn't won a playoff game now, and I think it's 30 plus years now since they've actually won a playoff game, but they have been to the playoffs numerous times with him. I mean, in 2013, since he was one of the powerhouses and you look at Andy Dalton, he threw for over 4,000 yards that year and over 30 touchdowns. And he's always consistently right around that 4,000 yard mark when he's got, you know, town around him and he, and he's able to stay upright. You know, he, he is a good quarterback. And the one thing, you know, that you, you never hear is that Andy Dalton does not struggle with the mental aspect of the game. You know, he can read defenses and he is a smart quarterback and he's an accurate quarterback because he's not the most athletic guy. So he is pretty accurate. And I would actually say right now, I think he's more accurate than Dak Prescott is. And I've said one of Dak's biggest issues is accuracy. You know, there's a lot of throws that he misses to guys that are wide open that are also game changing types of throws. So, you know, if he puts the ball on the mark, you know, the the Cowboys are now scoring a touchdown and in a position to win the game instead of, him missing that throw and in the fourth quarter he's got to lead a fourth quarter comeback and here's where I say stats can and will lie to you all the time because since Dak Prescott came in the league he does lead the league in fourth quarter comebacks and I said his stats are padded to the fact that if he made the proper throws during the game he wouldn't have to lead a fourth quarter comeback So it's almost like he padded his own stats. He missed throws in the second and third quarter to wide open guys that would have been touchdowns. And then, you know, in the fourth quarter, when they're trailing by a point or whatever it may be, you know, then he's able to put together the throws he needs and he doesn't miss those guys. So, you you know, you almost kind of wonder if he needs that extra pressure on him like oh I have to make this throw you know we need to win the game which isn't a bad quality to have but at the same time I need you to be able to make those throws you know when no matter what not just because there's pressure on you to make that throw so well, that's that would be that would be the kicker for you know getting that elite money is the fact that he can make those throws yeah. I mean you take last season for instance yeah they, were, yeah they were eight and eight you know number one offense in the league but they couldn't beat anybody with a winning record no, they had two wins against teams with winning records. Yeah, I mean, and down the stretch when they needed wins against, like, the Bills. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you win that game, you, you outright win the division, you know, yep. depending on how things played out. Like, you, mm-hmm. you just had to win two of your last, like, five games, and you were set. But yeah. the problem is they were all against winning teams, and yeah, struggled. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't put it together. And, yeah. it, you know, it was a mixed bag of things. I'm not necessarily going to say, like, 
all the games were were Dak's fault because you know. No, 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 no. It's, it's just, but you know, I mean, it's yeah. a quarterback league. You know, quarterback gets all the credit. Quarterback gets all the blame, no matter absolutely. what happened. Yeah. So absolutely. Like, and then you and you look in those games though. I I think particularly like the Bills game, like the passing game wasn't there. Like Zeke yeah. had to keep them in the game. Mm-hmm. You know, and like to me, for someone that's just trying to command, you know, elite level Drew Brees, Tom Brady level money you know you got to be drew Brees and tom brady yes. you know you got to be able to put up not necessarily the numbers because that's that's probably what people like well I, well I did i was throwing for four thousand yards but like no in those key moments to make that one pass that can change the game whether it's puts you in the lead or put the game out of reach from the other team like you got to be that guy yeah there's only certain times during a football game there's not going to be a whole lot of game-changing moments and and I'm not talking about necessarily like oh in the fourth quarter they need to come back it's just like you're gonna have a few times where you dial up a play and that play works to a charm you catch the defense in the blitz that you were hoping they would do and you know maybe the corner bites on a stop and go route or something like that where you get a guy wide open where chips fell perfectly, everything you planned happened exactly that way. And now you got that guy wide open to, you know, to catch it and score. And there were a lot of throws last year that he missed in that situation. I mean, a lot, a lot of throws. I said it was at least one a game where it left you scratching your head because, you know, he would miss that throw to a wide open guy you know, I, I specifically remember him missing Michael Gallup on a flag route against the Eagles where the corner actually fell down and the safety was on a blitz and he overthrew him by 10 yards. And it was only like a 30 yard touch pass and he overthrew him and it ultimately wind up costing us the game because of it. So it's those type of throws that I agree with you hundred percent that you have to make consistently to demand that kind of money. And like I said, he can go back and talk about his stats like, oh, look, you know, I was a 5,000 yard passer and 30 touchdowns. But you know what? If you're making the throws earlier in the game, then we're running the ball in the fourth quarter to run the clock out and stuff like that. And you're not throwing for 150 yards in the fourth quarter because you're trying to bring us back. So his stats were padded because of the inconsistencies earlier in the game. So that, that's why I hate when you get a lot of these pro analysts, um, you know, Stephen A. Smith, Smith and Max Kellerman are, were, were very bad with that. When, when he started talking about Dak, how do you not pay this guy? Look at his stats and blah, 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 blah. This is where I'm saying Stephen A. Smith, for as great as an announcer as he is, I feel like he does not know football as good as he thinks he does. Because if he was actually watching this game and understood the scenario, he would understand that he had padded stats. And he essentially padded him himself, not on purpose, but that's just how it fell. Because if he throws the ball the right way during the game, when it gets down to the last eight minutes and we have our workhorse Zeke in the backfield and this big offensive line who's been pounding on the defensive line all game and they're worn down, that's where we can run the ball down their throat because they're tired and we can actually run the clock out because that's the whole point is to get the lead. And then when you got a workhorse like Zeke, is to run the clock out. So it came time to that, and we weren't in that situation, and Dak was forced to, you know, throw 25 passes in the fourth quarter, which ultimately made him have, you know, 400 yards and three touchdowns, when really his stats should have been closer to like 270 with two touchdowns, which is still an absolute phenomenal day. That's a great day to have. You know, I mean, obviously, we've set the pinnacle at 300 yards a game is, is where you want your quarterback to be. But that's an exceptional game. To throw for 300 yards a game is, you know, exceptional. And if, and if you look at statistically, you know, you throw for <laughs> 300 yards a game, you are looking at a 5,000-yard season. And there's only a reason there's been, you know, a, a, you know, two dozen guys to ever throw for that much because it's, it's hard to keep that pace, even though that, that's what we think. Oh, well, you only threw for 250. That's, that's a great day. You know, that's, that's all you can ever ask for. So, but going back to bring in Andy Dalton, I think the reason why they did it was as an insurance policy so that Dak does sit out. They have this guy that can step in and he is extremely viable. 
um, I, I did, I have some friends that are Cincinnati Bengal fans. And I remember last year I was, uh, I, I was literally talking shit to him like, bro, how is Andy Dalton still your quarterback? The guy is absolute trash. And I mean, I stand by that in Cincy, his last couple of years, it wasn't good. You know, his coaching with um, Marvin Lewis and it had gotten stale and stagnant. And, you know, it was the same thing over and over again. And I meant since he absolutely needed to get rid of Andy Dalton, you know, they had had him for almost a decade. You saw what he can do with the personnel they had, and he wasn't good enough to get you over the hill with the personnel that he had, but him coming to Dallas with, and now being on talent wise, the best team he's ever been on without a doubt is going to change how he looks on a field. And it's probably a breath of fresh air to him as well. Cause you know, he's starting fresh again and there's no pressure on him to have to be this, you know, the guy that leads the way because he really was the face of that organization because who else has since he had in the past decade, they could be like, no, he's the face of the organization. It was Andy Dalton. So he had a lot of pressure on him to, you know, be the elite guy in Dallas. He's not going to have that kind of pressure on him. So he's going to, you know, be able to relax and he'll be able to learn, you know, Mike McCarthy's system. And he is a smart guy. So if we need to use him, I think he's extremely viable. I think him coming to Dallas was, you know, a great move for us and for him because it gives us an insurance policy and it gives him second life to prove that, you know, Hey, if I've got talent around me, I can actually be a good quarterback. And then I think about what it means for us off the field. And I I think it's just as big off the field as it is for if he has to play. Because him being a veteran, if you go back and you look at Dak Prescott's first year when he had Tony Romo in his ear because he had taken over for Romo and Romo was hurt and they decided to, you know, fully give Dak the ball and be like, this is your team now. And Romo being, you know, the high character guy that he is, you know, graciously handed it to him like, hey, but not only did he do that, he helped him so much. He, he turned into the coach. And when he was in Dak's ear and, you know, during the games, you could see him sitting on the sideline. He's right next to him. They're holding up the laptop. They're looking at what the last series looked like. And he's helping him diagnose the defense and what plays they were running and schemes and stuff like that. Dak had the best year he ever had as a rookie when he had a veteran quarterback in his ear helping him to see the things that you only get from a decade's worth of experience. So yeah, I, I think, think that would be more detrimental to him as far as the long term. If he's trying to get that big contract, you've been in the league five years. You need someone still to help point out holes in the defense. Like again, oh no, I I, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't disagree. <laughs> trying to get that big money, bro. <laughs> no, I, I I couldn't disagree more. It always helps to have another set of eyes to help you, man. No, yeah, but definitely not. I mean, Tom Brady still has you know, his coordinators and stuff in his ear on the sidelines. So does Drew Brees. So did Peyton Manning. You still have other guys that help you that you're bouncing ideas off of. Look, you know, they were in this formation and I went here. Maybe next time we should do it and try this. Yeah, but those are, those are coordinators and they're probably talking about which play they're going to call. Like not, not like, okay, this is what you saw in this defense. You know, this is what you needed to do, or this is what you should do. Like nine times 10, Tom Brady and Drew Brees know what they need to do. Like, that's why they're in perennial 4,000-yard passers yeah. and multiple the, CDs and no, no like, low-level picks and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's – But it's ultimately, the, what, ultimately what you just said is what I'm talking about. Andy Dalton is going to be like that coach for him. You know, in his fourth year in the league, he is going to be like that, that coach. And they say it, most quarterbacks will make good coaches – after their career ends or whatever it may be, because, you know, the quarterback is the leader on the field and normally, you know, one of the smartest guys out there and they, they have that intelligence to diagnose things and and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, even though it's his backup and he's a player, he, he's still acting as a coach, you know, and I think having that veteran in his ear will help him without a doubt. And just having another veteran in the locker room, you know, will help him. So I really don't see a downside to signing Andy Dalton. He was cheap. The fact that it is only a $3 million deal, unless he plays five games or more, and then it's worth the full $7 million. You know, um, 
a veteran contract in the NFL is a, a shade over $2 million anyway. That's the league minimum for a veteran contract. So the fact that we got him at just a little more than what, you know, bringing in a Joe Schmo off, off the street who's played in the league for more than five years and is considered a veteran to get that, you know, veteran contract. Mm. Uh, to me, it's a complete win-win, you know, it didn't really cost us anything. It's, it's got a big upside that if we need to go to him, there's a very good possibility. You, you know, you're not really going to skip a beat. You may, but it may not be, you know, anything huge. You know, you're obviously going to lose the um, athleticism where Dak is very good at um, shedding sacks and getting the hell out of the pocket when he needs to. I mean, Dak's a big boy. So, you know, guys grab onto him. He's able to break away. You're not, you know, you're not going to get that with Andy Dalton. But I do think you get a little more accuracy with Andy Dalton than you do with Dak. So, and I'll be honest with you, I hope we don't have to see <laughs> what Andy Dalton looks like. I mean, but like I said, it, it, it could be it could be not I'm not comparing players per se. I'm comparing the situations. But I mean, like I said, it could be a Steve Young type thing. You never know. You never know. I mean, everyone was willing to, to say that Steve Young was a draft bust in Tampa Bay, and all of a sudden he gets shit the the 49ers and now he's got a gold jacket. Yeah. Like, you know, who would have thunk it? You know, it could be a situation again, just right team, right components, right place. You know, he put a little flair in, in Cincinnati, but nothing really, really eye popping in. He comes to Dallas. Dak opens up the opportunity for him to take a team. And next you know, yeah, you guys roll 13 and three, make it to the NFC, you know, championship game. Hell, might even go into the Super Bowl. Who knows? Yes. But I mean, it would be, it would be as far fetched as it sounds, it's highly plausible. And like I said, the, the guy is a, a savvy, successful QB. He just couldn't win a playoff game. I mean, we literally – we just saw a very similar situation to this last year with Ryan Tannehill leaving Miami. Yeah. Everybody yeah. thought Ryan Tannehill was a bust. Like, look at what he did in Miami. He wasn't good, blah, blah, blah. Not only that, Ryan Tannehill had an enormous contract when he was in Miami. They had originally signed him. I believe it was one of those – ones that were close to $100 million, if not $100 million. Because I remember people freaking out, like, how the hell, if Ryan Tannehill is worth $100 million, then what the hell is Patrick Mahomes worth? $400 million, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, things didn't work out with him in Miami. And he goes to Tennessee, who had a quarterback with mm -hmm. Marcus Mariota. Yeah. Yeah. And things weren't really working out with Mariota, and he got hurt. And Tannehill steps in. And next thing you know, Tennessee is on an absolute rampage. Mm -hmm. And granted, a lot had to do with Derek, them finally being smart and being like, all right, we're going to give Derek Henry the ball 30 times a game because they should have did that from the day they drafted him. Yep. But that's a whole nother topic, why, why that guy was not the number one out-and-out -out starter from day one. But that's something that we had talked about and did put in videos that one of the dumbest decisions ever made the second Derek Henry was – drafted to Tennessee he should have been the starter there day one and getting the ball 30 times a game mm -hmm. hands down and if you tell me otherwise you're an idiot because mm -hmm. you saw what happened every time they gave the guy the ball he was phenomenal with it in his hands so and he proved it last year he finally gets the chance to be the number one guy and get the ball as much as he did and he wins the rushing title because he's an absolute monster at running back so yes a lot had to do with you know them finally going in that direction but at the same time Tannehill was able to throw the ball very well and lead that offense to the point that, you know, they, they were a playoff team who got in the playoffs and then beat the shit out of the Ravens mm -hmm. who, you know, everybody thought they were going to get destroyed by them because everybody got enamored with, you know, Lamar Jackson's speed and he can run and blah, blah, blah. And what it came down to was he can't throw. So it didn't matter if he could run because Mike Rabel, being a defensive guy, was like, oh, I've seen this before. You know, when I played against Michael Vick, how did we stop him? We went to a different defense where we brought in an extra defensive back or a safety and spied him. You pretty much move into a nickel and you keep the nickel corner as the spy. 
And they did that. And they kept Lamar Jackson in the pocket. And he got absolutely, the MVP got absolutely shit on. Because when it came down to, okay, I have to throw the ball now. I don't know if anybody remembers this. But, you know, they played that game in Baltimore. And he was throwing it into Delaware. Because he was overthrowing guys left and right because he doesn't have accuracy and he's not a great throwing quarterback. So we have just seen the situation with Ryan Tannehill going from yep. one team where he had been there for, you know, five, six years, whatever it may have been, never really had the success that they thought he was going to have, even though he had the size, the speed, the arm strength, all that kind of stuff. But he goes to a different team and it fits him. And the pressure wasn't on him because he was the backup. And when he got his chance, when nobody really was expecting anything, he lit it up. Yep. And look for him to be just as good this year because the situation he's in is the same. So, yeah, I, I think overall, I think the Andy Dalton pickup was a very smart move and a great insurance policy by them yep. doing that. And I don't think it puts any added pressure on Dak whatsoever because it's just another backup. So well, I don't, I don't think it's going to mess with him mentally. That's 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 my point. Like he's going to sign now. He has to sign. He has to. Like if he if he's got to mess around and throw away ten million dollars, you know, sign a thirty million dollar deal over you know x amount of years. Mm -hmm. I think he's more inclined to do it now because, like I said, I mean, Dalton is there. Like he can't, he cannot, he can't play the tricks that all these other quarterbacks do that don't have a guy that's viable to step in. Like he can, he can roll his chances with a team that doesn't have that old line, that doesn't have that receiving court, that doesn't have that running back. And yeah. Honestly, you know. here's, here's where I disagree. I, I don't think Dak is going to sign. I don't think he's nope. going to, I think he's going to play, but I don't think he's going to sign before next season. Because I don't think the Cowboys are – at this point now, I think the Cowboys are sitting back and they're just like oh, – They want to see. I, I, I think this was their plan from the start was just we're going to wait and see. You have to play yourself into $40 million. Show us that you can put together a legit season. We're going to get you a legit coach. We're going to bring in more weapons for you. We're going to give you, new, you know, an entire new bag of tricks. That way we know – whether it's you or somebody else that can't get the job done here in Dallas. So when they brought in Mike McCarthy and then drafting CeeDee Lamb and getting them all these extra people, they were pretty much like, we are setting you up for success. Now it's on you. Play yourself into that $40 million. Go win 11 games. Take us to the division championship. Something like that. And then we'll give you your money. Prove that you can you know, be this guy when you have these people with you. And we'll pay you no problem. He's essentially betting on himself. And Ryan Fitzpatrick did the same thing when he was with the Jets. You know, mm -hmm. he bet on himself. And he was just coming off a very big year for him. You know, brought the Jets, had 10 wins. You know, he threw for 4,500 yards. You know, Fitz magic was going on. The guy was, he was lights out at the time. And he decided to bet on himself. And he came out the next year and had a bad year. And... They, it looked like, okay, the Jets made the smart move. They didn't give you, you know, the $25 million you wanted. And he essentially wound up leaving the Jets and taking less money than he would have gotten if he would have signed the original deal the Jets offered him because he played himself out of it. And then the flip side of that was Kirk Cousins did the same thing with the Washington Redskins. You know, he was like, they tried to lowball him. No, you're only worth, you know, $18 million a year. He's like, no, I'm not. I'm worth more. And he played another year. Washington was good that year. You know, they actually were good that year. He, he threw for almost 5,000 yards, and Minnesota turned around and was like, hey, we'll give you $100 million. So he bet on himself and won. And essentially, that's what Dak's doing. He's throwing all his chips on the table, and he's putting it on himself. And he's like, okay, I'm going to bet on myself. I'm not going to sign a contract right now. I'll play out the last year of my existing deal which I think is fair. Whenever these guys talk about, oh, I'm sitting out because you're not paying me enough. Well, let's look at the flip side of that. If you sucked these past couple of years, you know, could I, could I pay you less? Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, well, you yeah. didn't play up to the, to the thing. Can I pay you less? So I hate when these guys do this. Now, if a team wants to re-sign you earlier than your contract is up and it fit fine, 
But for you to come to the table and be like, hey, you know, I am outplaying my contract. Well, there's only one year left in it. You're still in your rookie deal. And it's not like it was a 10-year deal. You know, then you can have an honest gripe. But it's like, hey, we're going to franchise tag you. We're going to pay you 30 times what you were making last year, you know. And we're going to see what this year does. And if this new coach coming in and the new weapons we gave you, if you turn around and you take us to the promised land, I'm not saying the Super Bowl, but show us you can get into the playoffs and, you know, get to the division, the NFC championship. Or, you know, even if you – even if you can't get us to the NFC championship, see if you can get into the divisional round and at least have us to where, you know, we're possibly able to win that game. You know, just show us that you are a legit guy that can, that can play ball. And I think Dak is essentially, that's what he's doing. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll play out, you know, my franchise tag and we'll see where it goes from there. But I, I don't see Dak signing during the season or anything like that. And the only way he does is if he legit does just, kind of fold and be like all right I'll I'll take the you know the the 34 million a year instead of the 40 he wants because that's what he wants he wants 40 million a year so if he takes anything less than that that's him literally folding you know that's a win for the Cowboys because I believe the last contract we offered him was right around the 35 million dollar mark so they were they were offering to make him the highest paid quarterback yeah I, 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 I and here's the other thing that could really be interesting with his contract negotiations. Patrick Mahomes is in the exact same boat as Dak right now, going into the last year of his deal. And Kansas City wants to get him locked up before the season starts. Now, Patrick Mahomes is going to make the most money in NFL history, without a doubt. The guy's been in the league three years. He's already got an MVP trophy, a Super Bowl trophy, and a Super Bowl MVP trophy in three years. And the two years he was a starter, because the first year he didn't even play. So in two years of him starting as the quarterback, he's won an MVP and a Super Bowl and a Super Bowl MVP. Yeah, so he's they, absolutely going to draw. If he goes in and is like, I want $50 million a year, he's probably going to get it. But here's the thing. I think – I don't think he's going to do that. I actually think he's going to take a little less money than people expect him to because I think he's smart and understands that because he is now the face of the NFL and with all of his endorsements that he's going to have, he can take a little less money to keep the players on the team that are helping him be this elite quarterback and staying on top of that division and in the NFL. So I think he's going to do like what Tom Brady does and take a little less money to help keep the people that are there and also help bring people in. So say the Chiefs do sign him and it's like 39 million. That would really help the Cowboys because then they could turn around and be like, bro, you want $40 million? Mahomes is only making 39, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have to see how this plays out because there's a lot of scenarios. But ultimately, my point is I think the Andy Dalton signing was very good. I think it really helps everything. I really don't see a negative side to this because anybody that wants to talk, oh, well, now there's a quarterback controversy. There isn't. Andy Dalton himself came out and said he knows he's the backup. And Jerry Jones said it and the coaches said it. Like, we know what, you know, we know the pecking order and Dak's on top of it. Andy's just there for an insurance policy. And if he gets his opportunity – then, you know, then things might get interesting because God forbid <laughs> that goes down to like week five and he's only going to be out like three weeks and he comes in and goes three and oh and he lights it up. Yeah, that then we might have a quarterback controversy and that could be a negative aspect of it. But, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But right now, there is no quarterback controversy. Um, I don't think the Cowboys has necessarily signed him as leverage. Because they can come out and try to say that, oh, well, we got a guy here that if you do decide to leave, you know, can be our future. I don't even think they believe for a second that Andy Dalton is going to be the future of the league, you know, of, of the franchise. He's got, yeah, nine, no, but, he's got nine years in already. You know, he's not. Yeah, but dumb, I mean, so. no, 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 not necessarily the future. Like you say, he'd be a stopgap. But the thing about it is he, 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 he's a stopgap with the potential of being, A, the franchise quarterback. Mm. I mean, yeah. and, and, and like, okay, you get a guy that's 
still in his prime playing, you end up and you draft the next Joe Burrow or the or the the, the next, you know, Tua Tagalovilova, whatever. Don't forget and Trevor get, Lawrence is coming out next year. Yeah, there you go. You know, you, you draft Trevor Lawrence, so you get him to fall into your lap some kind of way. You know, I mean, there you go. Yeah, that kid, that like, kid's going to be – he's going to be legit. Yeah. You know, you, you get in the – so now now your situation where you got like an Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre thing. So you got Andy Dalton that's, that's got all the wheels turning on, on a smooth, you know, on a smooth spindle, and you're having success, then, you know, yeah, because he's been in nine years, so he plays out maybe another three, four years, say, okay, I'm done. And then now your 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 star, the, your actual future quarterback steps in and bang. He's had time to learn from, from veterans. He had time to learn the system, yeah. you know. You've been able to actually retool players around him because, I mean, you know, you don't know how long Amari is going to play. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, get, you get new receivers, new defense, whatever. But either case, I mean, that Andy Dalton is is a vile – like, it's – like I said, it's not your traditional backup. It's not like, okay, Jimmy yeah. G goes down, C.J. Beathard has to step in. Like, you know – and, and like half the people don't even know who he is. Like, no, you got Andy Dalton that's going to step in, and he has the potential. Because yeah. it's funny, everyone drafts on potential, but after you've been drafted, no one talks about your potential ever again. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, then there's room for potential because one, he's in a new team, new environment. He's got new weapons. Everything is different. You know, he doesn't have one guy. He's got a like four speed, which leads to picks. Because yeah. he's trying to force feed this one guy to get the ball because that's his playmaker. Yeah, like AJ Green. Yeah, you know, or Tyler Eifert, mm-hmm. you know, where if either one of them gets hurt, which they're prone to do, your season's scrapped because you can't throw it to anybody else. Yeah. Like, but, no, this dude's got a plethora of weapons now. And that brings, I mean, and that, that per example, that's a perfect example of what I had said earlier. You know, you look at Andy Dalton when probably with the most when he had the most talent around him in 2014 when he threw for almost 4,500 yards and 30 touchdowns he had A.J. Green and he had Muhammad Sanu and he had Tyler Eifert at tight end Mm -hmm. so and then you know he had a slew of like slot guys but when they gave him legit weapons they they were a good team you know so yeah I mean the, the guys made the Pro Bowl numerous times i think he's made the pro bowl three times you know in nine years you know three times in nine years which actually is saying a lot because if you look at the quarterbacks that have been in the afc the past nine years only three quarterbacks get to go to the pro bowl so you figure tom brady makes it every damn year that he's not in the super bowl yeah well he still makes the team at least though you know what i mean they still you know he's still yeah he's still on the roster you know, and then there's like, okay, Philip Rivers. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he's an AFC guy. <clears throat> and then you also had Peyton Manning, who mm-hmm. is an AFC guy. You know, so for him to be a pro bowler, three of those nine years is saying that this guy can play. You know, he, he's not a bum. He's thrown for over 30,000 yards in his career. Like, he, he, mm-hmm. he can play. He'll be fine. Yep. So, and he just really needed a change, a change of pace a new team, a new set, and Cincinnati needed it too, you know. They absolutely needed it. And I think Cincinnati is is in a great situation. So I, I think they're going to, you know, be much improved too. We'll be breaking that team down as well soon. So, mm-hmm. yeah, overall, I think it was a great move. I don't see a downside to it. Yeah, me neither. There is isn't. Because, so. I mean, he either steps in, he plays, and he takes over the team and – you're out of paying paying him a big contract, or he doesn't. He just sits the entire season. Yeah, you didn't lose anything. You only pay him three million dollars. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Or, or just in case. Yeah, you need a backup quarterback regardless. So you know, right. what's the problem? You know, you got to have a guy, and to get a backup that's only three million dollars is is pretty cheap. When you look at what some of these backups are, you know, are making. You know, you look yep. look at what Jameis Winston just signed with the Saints. Yeah. So he's, you know, we, we got him cheap and he's, he's a legit backup. So yeah, I think it was a, a, a great move for them, for the Dallas Cowboys, you know, just 
yeah, it's getting scary because all of a sudden, like Dallas's front office is making smart moves. I don't like it. It's it 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 feels weird. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not used to this. It's just weird. Like some, there's, there's a glitch in the matrix or something. Something's going on here. <laughs> like, wait a minute, you guys are making smart moves. I feel like you're, I feel like this is a trap. Like you're giving me a false sense of, <laughs> I don't know if I like this feeling. Yeah, when that one big move they're going to make is going to be a mistake. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that'll be, we'll do something. We'll do something stupid to, to ruin this or, you know, actually let's see. It's May 5th. So a oh, single day mile. Um, so oh, yeah. nobody's been arrested yet on the Cowboys. That's that's a little different. So, well, cocaine ain't ain't ain't, ain't the big drug now. It's weed, and that's <laughs> evil. So, yeah, that's yeah. But nobody's nobody's like smacked or chick around or nothing. Like, oh well, it's quarantine. That's why you can't go to the bars, can't go to strip clubs, <laughs> can't go to clubs. You yeah. got to stay home. <laughs> True. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> no one to come in contact with to smack around. Okay, here's what's going to happen. As soon as they lift the quarantine, half the Cowboys team's going to get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, yeah, we're, I guess we're actually in agreement that it, it was uh, a good move. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, once again, we appreciate you guys watching. And, uh, you know, leave comments. Tell us if you think it was a good move, bad move. Um, feedback is always welcome. Again, if you – think uh you know anything to improve the video quality you know let us know i got a different camera coming too because i'm sure that will be a comment get a better camera like i ain't got a choice man this is the camera that's built into the laptop but i got the mic so mm -hmm. all i need is one mic so uh keep an eye out too we'll be dropping another video probably later tonight as well too because we are going to break down a another division so Keep your eye out for that. NFC West fans, because we're doing the West, right? Yep. NFC? Okay. So we're doing the NFC West. So be on the lookout for that. Any uh, Niner fan, Cardinal fan, you know, Seattle, coming for you. Coming for you. Going to let you know what's going on with your division and, and what to expect this year. And um, apparently it's going to be big things. NFC West is going gonna, is gonna to be putting big things out there. You know, three possible teams going to the playoffs. You know, so keep an eye out for that. Division and, uh, of football right now. What's that? In the toughest division of football right now. Could be. We'll see once the season starts because, you know, how you look on paper and how you play on the field are two different things. So we'll, we'll see how it actually pans out. But keep an eye out for that. And as usual, guys, you know, appreciate you watching and uh, be safe out there. Peace. Deuces. Deuces. <laughs>